Hallelujah. 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 It's always a privilege to worship God, to just be in his presence, just basking in it. Amen, family. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this, our fourth week in the summer teaching series called God on Film. And we've been looking at modern classics, blockbuster movies from a decade ago, and considering how we can apply biblical truth to some of the themes revealed in the movies that we've used. Now, we're not endorsing the movies, but we use the movie as a tool to identify some issues that happen in all our lives and see what God has to say about them. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Pride and Prejudice. So let's watch the trailer. He's here. Is he amiable? Is he handsome? He's single. I believe so. Oh, my goodness. Everybody behave naturally. Mr. Collins, at your service. In an era when marrying a rich man was the most a woman could hope for, Elizabeth Bennet was way ahead of her time. I singled you out as the companion of my future life. Sir, I cannot accept you. Don't worry, Mr. Collins. Tell her you insist upon them marrying. Oh, please. You will have this house. I can't marry And save your sisters from destitution. You cannot make me. <laughs> from Jane Austen. The beloved author of Emma and Sense and Sensibility. That is Mr. Darcy. He looks miserable, poor soul. Miserable he may be, but poor he most certainly is not. Do you dance, Mr. Darcy? Not if I can help it. What on earth have you done to poor Mr. Darcy? I have no idea. I do not have the talent of conversing easily with people I have never met before. Perhaps you should practice. May I have the next dance, Miss Elizabeth? It would be most inconvenient since I've sworn to loathe him for all eternity. You may. <gasps> He's so rich. By heavens, this is the snob you are. Focus Features presents the story of a modern woman. Mr. Darcy is engaged to my daughter. Do you think this union can be prevented by a young woman of inferior birth? Who discovered the one person she cannot stand is the one man she may not be able to resist. Can you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your circumstances? From the first moment I met you, your arrogance made me realize that you were the last man in the world I could ever marry. Do you not think him a handsome man? Yes, I dare say he is. From the producers of Bridget Jones's Diary and Love Actually. He's been a fool, but then so have I. We are all fools in love. Kira Knightley, Matthew McFadden, Brenda Blethen, Donald Sutherland, and Judy Dench. You have bewitched me, body and soul. I thought she didn't like him. So did I. So did we all. Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> there have been several films, theatrical plays, TV shows, and countless books that have been based on this timeless novel by Jane Austen. And the movie that we just highlighted was released in 2005, starring Keira Knightley and Matthew McFadden, and was nominated for several Academy Awards and actually won several other film awards. Let me give you a summary of it. So Pride and Prejudice is set in the 19th century in England, and it follows the Bennett family. The matriarch, Mrs. Bennett, is anxious for her five very different daughters to marry well, so the family avoids destitution. Elizabeth, or Lizzie, is the intelligent and high-spirited second daughter and is our main character. And she experiences the repercussions of hasty judgments and learns to appreciate the difference between superficial goodness and actual goodness. Near the start of the story, at a village dance, an affluent London bachelor takes an interest in Jane. Now, that's Lizzie's big sister. However, there is a less pleasant encounter between Lizzie and super-rich aristocratic Londoner Mr. Darcy, who declines to dance with her when she asked. Lizzie writes Darcy off as proudful and later becomes attracted to a charming soldier who, as it turns out, had a bitter relationship with Darcy. 
This reinforces Lizzie's bad opinion of Darcy, as she quite happily believes the lies she's told as proof of Darcy's character. After a series of entertaining events, Darcy professes his love and proposes to a bewildered and offended Lizzie. She refuses his offer, and when Darcy demands an explanation, she accuses him of, among a myriad of other things, breaking up her sister's new relationship, which he admits to doing. You see, Darcy is also prone to hasty judgments and had misconstrued Jane's shyness for lack of affection and judged the whole Bennett family based on their decorum. He eventually reveals the distasteful truth about the soldier and admits his judgment about Jane. And with these revelations, Lizzie begins to see him in a new light, a truer light. Then after another series of scandalous events, Darcy comes to the Bennett family's rescue and makes restitution on their behalf. Lizzie realizes how poor her judgment was and how it caused some of the drama, but thankfully, Darcy is still madly in love with her and proposes again. This time, Lizzie says yes, and almost everyone lives happily ever after. I want to speak to you today about making right judgments. Now, the word judgment has a negative connotation in our society, but it's often necessary, and it's a very healthy part of any community. A working definition of judgment is the process of forming an opinion or making a decision by discernment and careful evaluation. But in this movie, we saw the very opposite of discernment or careful evaluation occurring. In the story, it seems like Lizzie learned from her father to be sarcastic and opinionated about other people and both she and her father had disdain for conventional views of the importance of wealth and rank. This set them up to be judgmental about persons who were rich, profiling them and coming to improper conclusions. So proper judgment is different from being judgmental. And it's the same with some of us in that many of our prejudices are learned biases from our family or from our community, and they color our views of people and circumstances. We take note of people or we interact with them and then we make summary conclusions about who they are and why they do what they do. We judge them. For many of us, we don't realize the extent to which this coloring of our opinion is ingrained in our speech and our attitudes, but is something that can cause us to miss opportunities ruin relationships, and displease God. So today I want to help us see how we can change this behavior and be blessed and be a blessing. Now in the movie, Lizzie's prejudice against Darcy's personality almost cost her a happy marriage to him. And we can also fall into this trap and abort key opportunities too. For example, we move on from jobs and business partnerships because we jump to conclusions about the people that we have to work with without proper information or becoming hypercritical and intolerant of certain personalities. Sadly, we also find ourselves hurting relationships that we want to maintain because we judge people's personalities. Now, my elder daughter's temperament is very different from mine. She's so beautiful and very gentle. But I ended up distancing her from me for a while as I wanted her to be more of this or more of that, which was in essence really trying to make her more like me or more like what I would be comfortable with. But thank God so much has changed in our relationship now as I have corrected my approach you see, we're in relationship to love people as God has designed them, not to change them to our fantasy ideal, fantasy child or fantasy spouse, or poor judgments despise their beauty, dismiss their potential, and threaten their purpose. Really and truly, judgmental or condemnatory behavior is sin, and this sin, like every other, is subject to the principle of Sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping is a natural principle, but it's also a spiritual one as well. 
and it operates in the positive and in the negative. Our text this morning in verse 2 says, For you will be judged by the same standard that you've used to judge others. The measurement you use on them will be used on you. So, if we walk around unwisely judging others, we invite the same thing to happen to us. We also see the principle in Galatians 6, 78. It says, do not be deceived. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Our own standard of judgment of others will come back to us, like the spirit of judgment's past. Now, this is great if I'm generous and kind and a blessing to others, because I will reap more than I sow. <laughs> but not so great for sowing disdain, hypocrisy, and accusation. Ask yourself, do I feel safe? If God were to judge me the way I judge others. Our main test this morning comes from Matthew 7, and it starts by saying, refuse to be a critic full of bias towards others. Or, in a more familiar rendition, judge not lest ye be judged. Now, this scripture is misused all the time. Because it doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't use discerning wisdom and come to proper conclusions. Or in love, rebuke someone who is in error. Because sin is sin, no matter what the circumstances, and we should always call out sin. We should stand for godliness and defend the oppressed. In fact, as believers, you know, there will be a time when we'll even judge angels. You can read more about that in 1 Corinthians 6. But there's a big difference between judging arrogantly and judging with love and humility. As Christians, we're not authorized to be prosecuting attorney, key witness, jury, and judge rolled all into one. This is condemnation, and it lacks mercy. It lacks compassion. It lacks knowledge, and it displeases God. As children of God, we are to judge correctly, judging in justice, abuse and dishonor of God. And true love is actually incomplete without this voice of truth in the earth. So I want us to learn to do it right as we grow in Christ. Jesus, you know, warns about the dangers of unilateral condemnation. In John 8, he remarks to harsh accusers of the woman in adultery that let any one of you who is out sin cast the first stone. When I condemn someone's behavior, whether that behavior is blatantly sinful or just different from my own, I tend to pass judgment based on my strengths, and I'm completely oblivious to my areas of weakness. For example, a skinny person may look at a heavy person and judge them as lacking self-control. All they need is a bit more discipline, but such judgment does not give consideration to grace or even the possibility of childhood neglect leading to overeating, or even medical conditions. Here's another one. A person might see a lady of the night and assume that all she needs is an education and a steady job to leave that life without consideration to years and years of cycles of physical and mental abuse that makes these so-called normal decisions exponentially harder for her to do and to commit to because of rejection, because of crippling fear and self-esteem issues. And in the movie, Lizzie would be immediately taken in by the false modesty of a charming soldier while harshly judging the wealthy Darcy because he was a little standoffish. She assumed excessive pride rather than the possibility of just being nervous in social interactions. A rich man nervous. <laughs> her uncle later had to admonish her saying, oh, Lizzie, what a snob you are. Objecting to poor Mr. Darcy because of his wealth. He can't help it. <laughs> John 7, 24 says, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So how then should we judge? Judgment is always to restore 
never to condemn. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And even the criminal justice system seeks to bring restoration to the victim as far as possible and rehabilitation to the offender. So if restoration or rehabilitation is not your reason for your assessment, then maybe it's better that you keep it to yourself. Let's practice that the first thought that we have is to seek God's perspective about people and about situations through prayer and through the word of God. Let us be silent unless it's appropriate for us to comment. And let us look at the context of the situation, then assess with love and mercy what our next step should be. So let's break this down. So you can look in your sermon notes now, and you'll see the first filling, and it is that I will judge with context. You know, when God looks at a person, he knows everything. He knows their family history. He knows their current struggles. He knows their physical body. He knows their strengths and their weaknesses. So God's judgment is perfect because it flows from his omniscience. The more information I have, the more recent my judgment will be. You ever notice that the way we assess a stranger's failings is different to how we would assess the failings of a friend if they had done the same thing? We may jump to our friend's defense to justify their behavior. And that's because we have context. Context changes everything. I'm more capable of assessing the reason for a person's behavior when I have context. So there are some choices I make in order to judge wisely. Firstly, I choose to be silent when I don't have information. Since I'm not omniscient like God, no matter the circumstance, let silence be the first response. Too often I'm too far removed from the people or the circumstance, so I really can't reliably speak into the situation. My approval or disapproval is based on conjecture. In James it says, Dear brothers and sisters, understand this. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. And we should also choose to not cast judgment hastily with our friends. Proverbs 18 says, He who answers a matter before he hears the facts, it is folly and shame to him. You see, Lizzie's sister Jane refused to join in with Lizzie in forming hasty conclusions about Mr. Darcy. And sometimes we have to be that person as well. Sometimes we have to be the one who puts a pause on the unfounded remarks of our friends and our family. Don't be like Lizzie's best friend, Charlotte, who was quite happy to join in with Lizzie's mocking of Darcy. And then later on, Charlotte herself ended up being the victim of Lizzie's harsh tongue for agreeing to marry a disliked character in the movie. Imagine the irony of Charlotte angrily replying to her friend when she told her that she was going to marry this person. Don't judge me, Lizzie. Don't you dare judge me. <laughs> and thirdly, for context, we should choose to be engaged. We're designed for fellowship. So having a bridle on our tongue is not to say that we're to disregard community and the ills that we see in it. We're to do community well. We're to do it better than we have in the past, even if we're uncomfortable. We should get engaged and allow God to place us in contexts where we can be of the most help where you can know a person's struggle and speak a good word to them in that season, a timely admonition if they need it, not an unhelpful one. It is easier for someone to receive an encouragement or to receive a rebuke from someone who is close to them and really know them. So I encourage you to become a friend. I encourage you to get engaged in relationships. I encourage you to just look to the Lord if you find that this is an area that you struggle in. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Share each other's burdens 
and in this way obey the law of Christ. So be engaged at home. Don't be disengaged and don't know what's happening in your own house. Be engaged in your friendships. Like truly be participating in your friendships and be engaged at church. I've had to apologize to friends and family when I've disengaged from their world because I'm too busy. And then I see something I don't like that they've done and I jump to a conclusion about how they're living their lives. You know, these things can cause rifts in relationships because people feel unjustly judged, and maybe they are. But when I humbly earn the right and continually earn the right to really hear their experiences, then I can judge fairly and give advice that is truly relevant to their context today. In Proverbs 27, verse 9, it says, The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. Now, while we have context, context is not infallible. So our second feeling is we should commit to judge with revelation. You see, God knows all. He is the one who is omniscient. But more than that, God wants to reveal his knowledge to you and me. Jesus, speaking of himself in John 5, 30, says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. As believers, it's better if we judge a situation with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes when we don't pause to listen for that still, small voice, we open ourselves up to the deception of the enemy. So we are to follow the example of our Lord by always seeking God's will for others and judging rightly. So let's walk in God's truth about others. As we mature in our faith, we become more confident in hearing God's voice. And so we are confident to speak truth into people's lives and into their situation. We won't be just another condemning voice that prophesies death over them. As people of God, we are destined to be the eyes that see behind the veil of evil in lives. We're destined to be the heart that reaches out to forgive and restore. We're destined to be the voice of hope in our community. Are we ready for our destiny? In the movie, Lizzie eventually had to admit that she had been such a fool and that actually her pride had been wounded by Darcy's initial condescending words. And this led her to want to believe the worst of him. But when she let go of that stumbling block, she was able to express and receive love from Darcy, who turned out to be the man of her dreams. So, let, so just like Lizzie, let's be ready to recognize our own failings when God reveals them to us. And because we have feet of clay, let us judge compassionately, staying faithful to God's word, even while we're restoring people who struggle. Don't pile on judgment, but ask God what he sees in the person, not what we're seeing and looking at right now with our natural eyes and experiencing. Ask God what he sees even in organizations. There are some organizations that all we're seeing is, is corruption and and. We're disappointed, but ask God, what does he see in this organization? What does he see in this community that look like it's going nowhere? And then we just continually just declare positive affirmations over people. When you're seeing them mess up, just remind them who they are. Just declare positive affirmations over organizations. Declare positive affirmations over communities all across this island because our words have power, have life, and we have the capacity to see and know what the Lord is doing and wants to reveal in these situations. We have the capacity to speak it even when no one else can see it because we can see beyond the natural Let's encourage those who are younger in age or younger in faith right here at church. 
you know, those people who are good, but many times they need our support to see their own goodness and to move out from where they are right now to their next level. Maybe they're stuck. Don't join the voices that are telling them what they already know. They know where they are, you know. But it's our responsibility to not judge them and let them know who they're called to be. Has someone ever spoken that truth over your life? I want us to pause now. Let's just take a few moments. And I want us to ask God to show you someone like that who right now their, their behavior is they're like, my God. Ask the Lord in these few moments, who can I speak an encouraging word to this week? Who can I declare the truth over? All of us have the capacity to speak the Lord's truth, to hear the Lord's truth, and to declare it. So I'm just going to give us a few moments, and the Lord will review, reveal some persons to us that we can encourage. Don't worry if you're nervous. Don't worry, don't worry if you don't know what you might say. The Lord will tell you what to say at that right time. And an encouraging word that has the power of the truth of God behind it will have a ripple effect in that person's life. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 encourages us to rejoice, strive for full restoration, Encourage one another and be of one mind, living in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. This is how we do community well. And as we walk in God's truth about others, let's also walk in God's truth about ourselves. Let's look at the main text again. Verse 3 to 5 asks us, why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and yet fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own? How could you say to your friend, let me show you where you're wrong, when you're guilty of even more? You're being hypercritical and a hypocrite. First, acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them. And then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spots of your friend. In this passage, we're being encouraged to allow God to shine his spotlight on us. Now, we're at the beginning of the church year. Our church year runs from July 1st to June 30. And each year, our leaders go on a fast at the start of the year. So, all the TLC leaders, all 130 strong, yay, are on a 21-day fast as we consecrate ourselves to become ready for what God wants to do through us and through TLC in this church here. And in this final week, because we're in the final week of the fast, we're focused on allowing God's spotlight to show us all that is unfruitful in our lives, thinking of ourselves with sober judgment. And that's the same thing that I encourage all of us to do. We're not called to be judgmental towards others, and we're not called to be judgmental to ourselves. Sometimes we can be our harshest critic. But we are called to allow God to judge us. Because he is a perfect judge. His judgment is true. And his judgment is loving and timely. Now, when God does speak a right word over our life based on his judgment. We may have to face some truths about ourselves that he will show us. And we may have to let go of partnering with unfruitfulness 
We may have to let go of uh, some ungodly attitudes, some strongholds of sin, some wasteful behaviors, maybe even some irrational fears. Maybe there are some things that the Lord has been asking us to do and we're just not doing it because of all of these issues that are in our life. And he'll help us one by one, maybe two by two, to deal with them, to get over them, and to walk better for ourselves and for others. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. As Abba Father prunes us, believe me, all sorts of wonderful things start to bear. Compassion, patience, peace, and love in a manner that doesn't birth through any other process. It's only through pruning. It's only through letting go of certain things with the help of the Holy Spirit. And this leads me to my final point. I will judge with love. In Lamentations 3, 22 to 23, we declare, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Our feeling is we can know God's love. Because God wants one thing. He wants to restore his creation to himself to show his unfailing love to us through Christ Jesus, his son. His love is there for the taking. Receive God's love, believe it, live in it, and consider the magnitude of his compassion to us despite our flaws, our failures. He loves us unconditionally, unconditionally, unconditionally. And when we really do this, it's amazing how soft our heart becomes because we can't help but realize that God doesn't judge us to kill us. He doesn't judge us to be judgmental. He's not overbearing. He's loving and he's always gentle. And he wants to heal us. He wants to bless us. He wants to save us from a self-destructive path. And God is merciful to us. So you're also to be merciful just as your father is merciful. So we need to show God's love. You know, the world's judgment can be flawed. We're hearing of cases of injustice where people have been imprisoned for decades without trial. Of criminals who escape justice on technicalities and corruption. Of cases that drag on for years without due process still being incomplete. And because of that, judgment does leave a bad taste in our mouth. But family, we have to be different. We have to reflect God's justice, his mercy and gentleness as we navigate a world full of hatred, conflict, and strife. Sometimes that hatred, conflict, and strife is actually aimed at us. But we're pressing to learn how to assess every situation the way God does and love like God does. Now, this is easier said than done. In fact, it becomes a cliche unless we start seeking what God really means when he says he is love. And then we'll turn this world upside down. I remember when I became a Christian and... Um, people would be up here on the platform or I'd be um, listening to Christians who are older than I and they're like, God is so loving. And I'm like, really? That's, that's what you want to believe? Okay. <laughs> um, and I really, I was a little like Lizzie, a little bit like Lizzie. I tended to be sarcastic and opinionated. And I thought that it was really cliche and a little bit naive, the way persons walked in God's love, but press into his love. Really try and find it. It's when I decided that, you know what, I'm going to believe this thing. I don't see it in the world, 
But since God says he has it, maybe I can see it in him. And as I did that, I found myself, I don't know, one day I just found myself going, you know, God, he really, really loves us. And I was like, oh my God, I've become one of them. <laughs> just knowing God's love, it changes your whole life. It changes your perspective. It changes how you see other people. It changes everything around you. And you actually start to change everything around you. You actually start to ripple out, not only in how you experience others, but how people are going to experience you and experience everything around you. We affect this world. Little me, little you, we affect this world for the better or for the worse. We affect this world. So let's affect this world with love by pressing in to just understand God's love, what it really means. 1 John 4, 7 to 10 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know, does not really know God. Because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus Christ does not judge you. He loves you. And he wants to save you from judgment if you accept him as your Lord and Savior. And today is your opportunity for Jesus to bring you into loving fellowship and eternal life. If you want to do that today, will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me, that you promised me that you will save me from judgment. Accept your free gift of eternal life today. I confess and turn away from my sin. And I ask you to forgive me. Come into my life now as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, God, for your salvation. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you, God, for your mercy and your compassion. That you don't treat me the way I deserve. That you see me differently. Amen. Now, if you pray this prayer for the first time or again after a long time, congratulations. I am so happy. And we at TLC want to help you with your next steps. So um, you can navigate to a link that's in the description of the video to accept Jesus as Lord right now. And when you go there, you just check the box that says, I just prayed for salvation. And I want to pray for you that you'll mature in every way, growing in love, exercising judgment with justice and with mercy. The title of this message was, What Does the Lord Require of You? And in Micah 6, 8, that question is answered. It says, He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I want to pray for us. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning, every morning, every morning, every morning, your faithfulness is there. Every morning, your love is there. All my life, your love has been there. 
You have kept me. You have kept us. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, God, that you don't judge me harshly, condemning me, Lord, the way the world sometimes condemns me. Lord, I pray for us that we will grow in love. That, Lord, we'll seek you, God, not out of rote, not out of requirement, but out of a desire to just know your heart, to know your heart towards us, to know how you feel about us, to know what you call us, to know that what you want from us, because what you want is good. What you want is pleasing. What you want will make me truly happy. So God, I submit myself just to the show of your love. We submit ourselves, Lord God, to just the reign of your grace. Just pouring down on us. Pouring down on us. Pouring down on us. God, guide us into that quiet place where we can sit and talk with you, God. Where we can hear you, Lord, telling us who we are. Telling us the truth when all around us people are telling us lies. You are the truth, God. There is no lie in you. So I declare, and we declare today that we trust you. We trust your truth. We trust your judgments. We trust your judgments, Lord, that you speak from your own mouth that you speak in the word. We trust every promise that you have there for us. We trust every admonition. We trust every rebuke. We trust every firm word. We trust that it is for our life. We trust every word, Lord God, that you place in the mouth of those who you have assigned to us to encourage us, to teach us, to draw us up, to walk alongside us. We trust them, God. We trust them, Lord. We trust the people of God for us to, to make a decision to partner with them in life groups, in accountabilities, in friendships, in ministries, Lord. Today we declare, Lord, that we trust our community that you have formed round about us. Lord, where we have walked in fear, where we've walked in doubt, where we've walked in pride even, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to forgive us. Surround us with your truth, God from the people of God. Guide me into your truth, God, from your word. Lead us, Lord, into your truth from your glorious presence. And help us, Lord, to surrender to right judgment. and to learn how to judge rightly ourselves. We bless you and thank you, Lord, for the purpose that you have in our lives. We bless you and thank you, God, for the way in which you're going to change the world through us. We bless you and thank you, God, that you call us world changers. 
We bless you and thank you, God, that we are the light of the world. Little me, little you. We bless you and thank you, God, that we are not little. We bless you and thank you, God, that we are large. That we are seated in heavenly realms. That we do your work in this earth. That we change everywhere that we go. With every step that we take. That we neutralize the judgments of the enemy over our family, over our friends, over our community. We neutralize that in the name of Jesus. That by the power of God, we even reverse what is in the natural. That we confound science because we walk in your power. Because we walk in your truth. Because we're able to see what should be and speak a right word to make it so in the name of Jesus. Lord, I declare over the people of God a new day, a day when we walk in the love and authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. A day when our eyes see the way God sees and our mouth speaks only what God speaks and our heart loves the way God loves. When we become faithful judges in this earth, and turn this world upside down. So all glory to you, God. All honor and praise to you. Hallelujah. 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 We give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen.